What's up, guys? It's Wednesday, which means hashtag Ask Jake. Let's hashtag get this thing started with hashtag question from Will Ferrell number one. We got four from him, actually. Number, question number one. Do you think Owen Hart, Macho Man, Randy Savage, and Miss Elizabeth should be inducted in 2014 WWE Hall of Fame? So that's question one. And I respond to that with no. Hear me out here. I want Macho Man himself, with Miss Elizabeth, I guess, in 2014, and then Owen in 2015. I feel like that's the best way to do it. Just, I don't know if the entire foundation's in there yet. Let's just put 2015 entire Heart Foundation in there. I think, you know, that would, I'm, I'm guessing Brett's in there. I don't, there's not a real Hall of Fame, so I'm not super concerned with it. But when you have a physical Hall of Fame, you have to have something in there symbolizing the Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh, yeah. The Macho Man. In the Hall of Fame. Has to be. But 2014, I don't want to see both on there. Because it kind of, it kind of sets up to where, I mean, you know, Another they're both, another year is not going to hurt anything. And it sets it up to where they both get, you know, respectable time to shine, which it needs to happen. Question two, what movies are you most looking forward to see this summer? I have no idea. I haven't seen the Super, Superman movie yet, or uh, This is the End. So let's just go with those, because those are something. I am excited for the War Games DVD next Tuesday. Big fan of the War Games matches and a big fan of early 90s WCW. Don't know why, but I'm drawn to it. Question three. Do you think Paul Heyman should be corrected? Create creative director of WWE? I don't think so. I think this uh, where he's working at right now is fine. And I think that what they're doing now, they're starting to, you know, gather things together. And, and things are becoming more sensical, sensible. Sense. Sensible, not sensical. So, things are being built properly now. And, you know, Heyman's an awesome dude. would be great at it. It's just uprooting the people who are in there now is kind of, like, counterproductive. Plus, you don't know how long Paul wants to be there for. You know, you know. That's just my take on it. I, I would like to see him in a, in a role in creative, but as a creative director, no. And then the final question from him... Sorry, he sent four. I gotta answer all four, guys. For the, uh, do you like Stanton Enfield on Franklin and Bash? Yes, I do. I feel like he's the perfect authoritative figure because he's mean when he needs to be, cool when he needs to be, and there's a lot of you know complexity to his character. Plus, I love the show. I mean, you know, I feel like if you were to take '90s Zach Morris. And then Bash, when he was on Clueless, I can't remember his character on Clueless or his, or the actor's name. He's just that good. And you were, and I feel like if those characters would have continued on, they would have met up and became Franklin and Bash. Here we got on this one. Makes sense. Great show. If you're not watching, you need to watch it. Not need to, but it's cool. This next question is from Nick Glenn. If D. Bride's beard had a baby, what name would it be? What would its name be? D. Bride's beard's baby. Uh, baby dragon. I don't know. That, that's that's good. That question's gonna haunt me. No, as soon as I end this, or hop another question, a better answer come out of my head. I'm going to go Baby Dragon, or Beard Dragon, I don't know. Baby Beard? I don't know. It's it's a beard child. Well, how would that be? Like, because I have a, you know, all right, playoff beard right now. Would it be like if my beard had a beard attached to it? I don't know. Crazy question. Can't answer it. Uh, this next question is from Venomous14. How excited are you for RVD's return, and what do you think want to do with him? My phone on this I am very excited for the return of Rob Van Dam. Just because I, you know, this goes into what I want to do with them and all, what I want them to do with them, what they think they should do. I don't think he's coming back to be a main event player. 
If you think he is, that's he's a spot. He's a spot time guy in the main event. I don't see him going out there and becoming the face of the company. No, not at all. I see him in the same role Chris Jericho's in right now, and that role that Chris Jericho was in at the start was great when it came to elevating people. And this is and Rob Van Dam is a great way to elevate a different sort of guy. I mean, The Rock, do he help elevate John Cena? No. Poor Punk? No. Undertaker did, though. Undertaker very well helped Punk become even bigger, it feels like. Maybe it's the last match in Chicago. There was a part-time guy who was helped. Uh, but Jericho was helped out a ton. Brock hasn't really been in a situation like that. All these guys they were bringing in and these big name signings really are just there to just draw ratings and draw money and all that. And it's it's cool and all. You know, money is money and ratings are ratings and it's great to see those high buy rates. But there has to be something more, I think. And I think they're getting to it with Punk versus Lesnar, which is basically a dream match for a lot of people. Now Lesnar versus Daniel Bryan is gonna be the match I think that takes it over the top. Just because Lesnar had more matches under his belt by then, and that's going to happen. I don't care what y'all say. And Rock versus Randy Orton would be pretty awesome, too. Because both those guys could... Randy Orton's timing is awesome. They could put on a good show. But Rob Van Dam could face a litany of people. He could face Punk. He could face Brian. He could face Cena. You know, those are three guys right there in the main event that all other guys could face. But the thing is, he could go in there, he could face his Ziggler and be believable. He'd be like, you're the whole show? Well, I'm Mr. Monday Night. Stuff like that. You know, he could go in there and he could feud with the mid-card guys. You know, he could feud with an Antonio Cesaro. There's not much base behind it, but it could, it could be done. He could have some solid matches with Sin Cara, probably. If they're looking to go that route. There's a lot of guys in that step-down area that could use the boost of having a good match with Rob Van Dam. Do I think he could put up and put a good match out every week on Raw? Not one bit. Not one bit. He's old. He's like 50. And there's some point to where you're just going off the mystique in your name and the couple spots you have, and you can't go out there and put together that awesome match. I mean, Jericho's proven it a little bit, too. Because like, you watch the old Jericho matches, and those were awesome. And the New Jericho matches are a different sort of awesome, but it's because he was so good before that he could put on these. Robin has the same way, and having guys like this is not the worst thing in the world. Because think back to before the Attitude Era of how many big name guys there were there. And they're all gone. You know, you had the Diesels and the Razor Ramon, and I think Hogan bolted right there in the 94, 93 range, and Flair, Bol Flair bolted and when all those guys left, those guys had already had matches in the early 90s with other, you know, other guys with the Bret Harts and stuff like that. So when it became time for it to be Bret, it was great. And for us to have that next Attitude Era, or I like to call it the Wrestling Boom, another one of those, would have to come from the guys who are there now, you know, the younger guys, the Cody Rhodes of the world and I want, you know, Ziggler and Brian and Punk are all in their mid, like, low 30s. But I think they can wrestle in their 40s, which is 10 years from now, which is solid. Cena's like 36 or so. Uh, but Ted DiBiase is somebody who's young there, has some talent, needs to figure some stuff out. Sin is young, too, and a bunch of guys they have in this company are young. And when these other guys step away and these guys get that chance to go up, there has to be something that makes you you know, want to watch them already. Not because having a match in the past or a feud in the past that really sets them apart. And I think a Cody Rhodes against Ralph Van Dam package would be, I mean, a feud, would not hurt Cody Rhodes one bit, even if he went out there and lost three quarters of the matches. Think about it for a second. It's a chance to get an established name that people will tune in to see, people will pay attention to, just to even see, well, does he still have it? against a young guy who has every tool that you need and just needs something to stick. And he hasn't had that moment yet, you know. Because the guys, he, you know, he's had that 
when he was in when he was in Legacy, he was a other guy. And when he feuded with Orton a little bit last year, he was feuding with Orton. And that helped him get some credit, some uh, credibility inside the company, but that wasn't any outside draft. And I feel like his best stuff came after he had just feuded with Rey Mysterio. Because that was in, what, 2011? And he carried that through when he wore the mask and had that awesome run on SmackDown. That came, we feuded with an established guy, Rey Mysterio, who, Rey Mysterio is not Rey Mysterio in the 1990s. But the name, the mask, the aura of Rey Mysterio got you to watch and got people to respect the dude and care about the dude. So that's the thing I should do about Van Dam. Uh, next question is from Spotless Rep. How's it going? How do you feel about route bagging on all of your guys' videos? We see it. We know it's a vi we know it's a concern. Obviously, videos that are 45 minutes long are not going to be clicked on by somebody scrolling through, like looking for a review that hasn't seen us before. So yeah, in a, in a way, we are limiting our ceiling. So we understand that part. Mr. Rod always says your videos are too long, in case you guys are wondering. And we respect his opinion. His, opi his opinion is right, but it also... Shortening our videos almost would restrict or constrain what we're trying to do. Because we were just trying to have fun and talk about everything. Because when we started doing this, it was like, we started just going, okay, well, let's just talk about everything. You know, we started writing down the stuff and then we'd go and then we'd talk about it. Because we felt like sometimes, you know, the parts that we liked in the show was different than someone else's. But we still want to hear an opinion on it. And if somebody just glanced over it, it was kind of like, uh, eh. and then so that started that started happening, and then what took on a life of its own is the fact that Justin and I have been playing Halo with each other since 2007, 2008, 2007, around that range, like ten thousand, like thousands of games, and when you're playing Halo, it's not as much about Halo as it is killing time and just BSing and telling stories. So we kind of pulled, we kind of. That kind of became us. We have this ability to sit there and get carried away and start talking about something and it carries on. So that's why you see like the solo videos are a little bit short as we carry it off into a passionate story, tangent. But we understand and we're more conscious that we don't waste time in videos. Like everything has to be something. We're not just sitting there twiddling our thumbs and all that stuff. But him putting on a Bane mask and talking about a segment with his awesome voice from Batman, where he pretends to be Bane, is incredible. I think my preacher stuff's good, too. And that wouldn't work if we weren't doing it about segments that were just eh. Like, if the, if the stuff that we were doing was... Uh, I mean, if the stuff we were, talking, we were talking about the main event with those voices and stuff, you guys get pissed. You'd be like, oh, wow, I didn't take it seriously. How do you guys really feel about this? You know, because most, most people tune in for it. And 20, 80% of you only care about 20% of what happened on the show. And that's just Perio's principle, and that's true to most things in life. So what we do is we make sure that the other 20% that is a lot of times neglected has something. And also it's more fun and it's kind of who we are. So, it's, I mean, we don't, we, obviously he's under, we understand what he's coming from, and also we don't take his stuff, like, we're not saying we take it seriously, but we know there's a lot of, I don't know the word, embellishment, something, where it's not like he 100% is like super mad at us. It kind of became almost like a running joke, like, oh, wow, another Tree of Show video is 50 minutes long. Not 50 minutes, like, two, another 30 minute video. This video is like 10 minutes too long. And this video, and this comment is posted two minutes after he posted the video, so he hasn't watched it yet. So he doesn't know if we're killing time or not. But we also know that he's just, he's saying it to get, to make us almost aware that we can't waste time in there or else people aren't going to watch it. We see people like the video, the long video, people don't like it. It's a give and take. Because he is somebody that people who watch YouTube wrestling reviews knows, his opinion is one that you see and go, 
Oh, yeah, I know him. And it sticks you a little bit more, so that's why, I guess. Are we going to make the video shorter? Only if Raw starts to suck, we don't have things to talk about. But, I mean, I don't know. It's Do I feel like we get carried away on dumb stuff sometimes? Yeah, but I feel like if we didn't, we'd just be like, just like everyone else and nobody would watch us. So, give and take. Next question is from Ron Carlson. What was the reaction of everyone involved when Brock came out around? So to set the scene, <laughs> there was myself, Colby, Justin, and Justin's two cousins who are 10 and 6, probably, around that range, maybe 12 and 8. But they're still 100% convinced it's real. They're, per they're marks. They're little kid marks. It's awesome. Perfectly awesome. And then you have myself, Jibs, internet wrestling fan, Justin having a good time, and Colby, who's everywhere and nowhere and an enigma. She's somewhere between all of it. So we got a, every different stereotype, really, besides this guy who hates everything. We didn't have any of those guys. We didn't hang out with those guys. Everyone freaked out. When Punk, when Lesnar came out, the kids freaked out because it was like, oh my gosh, he just laid out CM Punk. Oh. And then all three of us freaked out is because this they pulled the trigger on having Punk Lesnar, which we wanted to see. And this was kind of like, we were freaking out because it happened and because of what it's leading to, hopefully leading to at least. Every time Lesnar's laid out somebody, it's led to that. So, that is, uh, that is, my answer was pandemonium. And then the final question was from A.W. Whitford. And he asked, who do you want to have the WWE title next? Which leads to some fantasy money in the bank booking and booking from there out. I want to be Mark Henry. I want Mark Henry to win a clean the money in the bank. Do I think this devalues you Cena a little bit? No, not at this point. Even though he's had the title since WrestleMania and losing at Money in the Bank, it's kind of like, eh, eh. At this point, it's a, it's a, it's a considerable reign. He's fought some adversary. He's fought some good opponents. Beat The Rock to get it. Beat The Ryback twice. Tied The Ryback. Beat, beat The Ryback. And now we've moved on to Mark Henry. Beating Mark Henry would just lead to what? Brock Lesnar, CM Punk, Daniel Bryan. Maybe. Mark Henry beats John Cena. The floodgates are open. And not only that, people are going to be drawn. Oh, wow. Mark, the people who haven't watched in years, that Mark Henry is WWE champion now. Oh, i got to tune in and see this. Sexual chocolate. And then they say, new scary. That's what I do, Mark Henry. Which is like a pseudo real thing to where it's you can tell it's like Mark Henry the person acting out through the character of being oppressed for all those years of being all that dumb stuff. And he's also super scary and it has some of that kayfabe he beats everybody up thing too. You can see him being a, I don't know if he's a I don't know if he's a healer or a face, he's a monster either way. And that's what they need, because you can only have so many Superman before you I mean, so many, I guess Superman, I guess, before you have to have the Punisher or Iron Man or some other comic book guy. Obviously, Punk was Batman. I don't, I think, uh, when you look at Mark Henry, though, the guy has appeal in so many different ways. You all, you have to have him run with it because a couple of years ago when he was doing that Hall of Pain, Mark Henry killing people stuff, it was awesome. And everybody, everybody involved watching that was so drawn to him and cared so much about what Mark Henry was going to do that we didn't think it mattered if he was healed or face. As soon as he came out, your eyes were watching and you were reacting to everything. So even though he was, like when he was beating up on Daniel Bryan, I was like, boo, boo, that's my boy, my boy, D bro. I was back when Booker T was on commentary and that was my very five. And then when he was fighting the Big Show, I was like, yeah, get him. Beat him up. So, 
I think having a character like that is something that will carry you through the summer. And it kind of it gives his career a full circle of starting off as the world's strongest man and being generic baby face and then being in the nation of domination or sexual chocolate, then nation domination, and then the May Young stuff. I'm a sexual chocolate after that. I'm not really sure with that timeline stuff. And then kind of just being there. Just being there and not really having any direction, being like, not realizing that him himself, he himself is the world's scariest man and something that people would tune in to see. And yeah, I do think hot shotting it off the scene right now for the hot guy in Mark Henry would be the best call for business. Cena chasing it or Cena out for a little while would just give a chance for everything to kind of shift a little bit and to see what survives the ship, you know. Like, their only way to test to see how, like, it's like they're building a ship in a bottle. And the only way to see if they've glued things right is to start gently shaking it. And if they built the ship properly, it can withstand more shaking and the world's turning while still being cool. I guess more, they're going to be a snow globe. If you have a crappy snow globe, shaking it around sucks. You're like, oh, well, just put it back to normal. It's a cool picture and, you know, and a little snowflake everywhere. Plus, it's falling apart and you don't really like to see all this. But if it's something that when you start shaking the snow globe and the snow cascades around the stuff that really paints the picture of being awesome, that's what it could be. And that's a really weird metaphor. And I don't know on that note. Also, hashtag ask Justin for the next videos and shout out to the black YouTube wrestling community. We in there. Ah. Uh.